The Enshittification of Digital Marketing. Companies are often founded because the founders have a mission, see an unresolved problem, spot and solve a market inefficiency, or think ahead and create something disruptive and revolutionary in comparison to existing products. While in startup mode, the focus is on creating innovative products and our services, the first few clients will happily provide feed feedback, which is used to further innovate the products and our services. Quality matters. The company grows. A few more clients have been onboarded. The products have matured and the company is ready to scale. Startup becomes a scale up. And before you know it, you'll have 20 full times employees on the payroll. Fast forward a few years. The company went public and the company now is the market leader in its segment. Each quarter, the executive team will have a shareholder's call to present the results and numbers accompanying with the achievements, press releases, etc. At this moment in the maturity cycle of the company, who or what influences the success of the company? You might think the good product, but will a better product get more market share? Nope. The current market share is mainly the result of marketing and sales, and the financial success is based on the legal accounting department having optimized profit and profit per share leveraging international tax structures. A better product wouldn't make a big difference simply because the company already is the market leader. Hence, the best marketing, sales, accounting, and or legal employees are promoted, and over time, the company will be run by these very same people and the original great product people. They'll get frustrated and eventually leave. As technology, technology is going forward at even ever increasing pace, their knowledge and experience is welcomed at new startups and scale-ups. How do the public companies grow and innovate? By making innovations that aren't in the best interest of the advertisers, only for the shareholders and the bonuses. For example, platforms that by default enable audience networks promote showing your advertisements on long-tail websites. Goal-based campaigns, also known as performance max campaigns. This describes life cycle. Startup and product creation, scale up, going public, then decline. is typically what happens when the shareholder value is greater than the product. Remember how great Facebook was a long time ago, and then your parents and Aunt Judy sent a friend request? How your feed only contained posts made by friends and wasn't flooded with advertisements or promoted content? Remember how eBay had great deals where non-professional people would sell from their attic on the cheap? Then the pros came in, first with auctions with the reserve, later with a fixed price, then promote it with preferred spots. The same happened with Dutch version marketplats.nl. Remember how Google search once showed great results? Just take a look at the results the engine throws out. First results are promoted and the other results showed are not in your interest, but to maximize profit, i.e. clicks on advertisements. These results contain MFS made for search results, websites, keyword optimized sites and blogs showing programmatic ads hoping to monetize your clicks. This decline of service doesn't improve the user experience. Corey Doctorow came up with the word enshittification to describe this life cycle from the end user's perspective. And shittification. Uncountable, the phenomenon of online platforms gradually degrading the quality of their services, often by pro promoting advertisements and sponsored content in order to increase profits. Platforms, both social media and large media sites, and even web shots, sell advertisement space on their platforms as a stream of income. To monetize this, they'll need real human users to consume those advertisements. When their service was great to the humans using their service, the humans would gladly stay on the platform and thus consume the ads automatically. As time progresses, the companies running these platforms need to keep showing growth to their shareholders. With double-digit growth, sooner or later, they'll run out of humans. What to do? Supply and demand will dictate increase the price of advertisement slots, but not in online marketing because of the fear that advertisers will run away. So the alternative is to bend the rules. YouTube showing targeted personalized ads to children and dilute quality by allowing, allowing third-party audiences to be part of the platform, e.g. E fan, Facebook, Pangle, TikTok, MSAN, Microsoft, TrueView, YouTube, etc. just to keep hitting targets. Audience networks and programmatic make 
money through the so-called attribution model, i.e. pay per impression, clicks, et cetera, to survive financially, they need to attract lots of humans, which is expensive and near impossible at scale at these low fees. This is where the demand for artificial traffic and inflation of numbers, bots, ad stacking, transparent ads, continuous reloading, carousels, MFA, loading video ad, completion pixel, browser extension, injection ads, mobile app loading, apps in the background, etc. comes from. To prevent pain attribution to bots and fraud, these platforms have their own fraud verification tools and are partners with fraud detection vendors. Fraud verification vendors. The two most prominent fraud verification vendors in the added space originally started as innovative companies. Their solution matched with the back then technology required to detect and flag bots, click fraud, etc. Again, these companies grew, became public listed, and a market leader duopoly in the ad verification segment. As described above, quarterly numbers became more important than innovative technology. Shareholders value greater than quality of product. The product is ad fraud detection. And the fraudsters, they continually improve their bots. Once detected by the large or any of the small innovative companies, they'll adapt, learn, and update immediately. They don't work for VC money or shareholders demanding quarterly growth. They generally work for themselves, renting out their service. Quality is key to their success. The lack of quality detection by the duopoly also helps the platform hiring or partnering with the verification services in exaggerating their numbers. They would report the truth as Oxford Chronic Chronometrics sees it, which is way more than the reported 1% of platform and ad verification company lose. The relation between ad verification companies and the platform is more symbiotic than principal agent. This relationship causes brands to overpay for the given service buying advertisement space. Of course, the additional ad verification price is included in the price. What can be done about this? When you have for example, 20% fraud in your campaigns, it absolutely doesn't mean that 20% of your budget directly goes to fraudsters. As AMBA PwC shows in program, program, programmatic, half the money the advertiser spends ends up in the supply chain, the middleman. The other half goes to the publisher. The 50% or so going to the publisher is again broken down, run in infrastructure, create attractive content, although when running subprime traffic bots They'll just hit your site without quality content. To break it down, only a subset of this max 10% is attribution for clicks or generate leads. That's the part ending up in the fraudster's bank account if they are not detected within the invoicing term. If they are, they'll get nothing except the monthly invoice from their cloud providing running the botnet and the residential proxies they have been using. So how big of a problem is this? I'm sure if ad fraud would mean 100 billion less collected taxes annually, the problem would have been addressed. But as a lot of the fraud sticks at middlemen and they do pay their taxes, it's just a market inefficiency. And the fraudsters, they either operate as a legitimate business and thus pay their taxes depending on the country they operate. In the end, if you generate a lot of bot traffic out of thin air, besides some cloud costs, it is almost all pure profit. And at these volumes, the dollar amount is well enough to fund large troll farms, disinformation tactics, and be able to influence elections and probably even help evil regimes. The only way to break this cycle is when companies treat marketing as an investment in future customers and sales and monitor the investments as such. Clicks, views, how many marketing qualified leads, MQLs are not important. It's about quality and sales, closed deals, customer acquisition costs, CAC, customer lifetime value, CLV. The CAC to CLV ratio, minimal greater than preferably the churn rate, this can be only achieved by continuously measuring the output. Remove the poor performing parts and start reallocating and optimizing your budget to where it works. Stop blindly spending huge amounts of money. Stop using low quality audience networks. Use a whitelist of domains where your ads are shown. Use a whitelist of mobile apps. Realize that the lowest CPM is probably the lowest quality bots. The most basic first step is to start measuring fraud at your landing pages. Click fraud arrives at your landing page and the use of output to know which sources and campaigns are clean and which stink. Also, when selecting a, a fraud verification company, where in the life cycle are they? Still at a great quality product or pushing for deals preferably with a three-year locking to hit quarterly results? 
Once you'll have a great fraud detection, you'll see the cumulative effects over time. Compound returns on the continuously re-optimized campaigns, clean data, know who your real audience is and not bots or click farms with fake profiles, etc. Want to know more? No more? Contact, contact us directly at Oxford Biochronomatrix. Thanks a lot.